it is my pleasure to warmly invite uh, Professor Mark Hallett, uh, who is very well known to the World Federation Neurology community as uh, he used to be our Editor-in-Chief for World Neurology not long ago. And uh, the Professor Hallett is also a well-known name in the field of movement disorders. Uh, Professor Hallett, very good morning to you and a warm welcome to World Federation Neurology YouTube channel. Well, I'm very pleased to talk with you. Mark, uh, as you are aware, uh, World Federation Neurology and International Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society, or mostly known as Movement Disorder Society, which you are very part of uh, at the, the formative days, uh, are joining forces together to dedicate 2020 World Brain Day on Parkinson's disease. How excited are you to see these two massive organizations uh, joining forces together to advocate for Parkinson's disease in 2020, despite in the middle of a pandemic? Right, well, this is clearly a, a very important uh, topic and it's uh, one of the main, uh, of course, central interests of, of the movement disorder society. It always has been. Uh, Parkinson's disease is uh, probably the most important disorder that we deal with. Uh, and it's very nice to see the World Federation of Neurology team up with MDS in this regard. Uh, it's very clear that uh, Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease, are becoming more and more important. Um, the, as the population ages, uh, these, these illnesses are becoming more frequent and are a very important source of disability in the population. So it's uh, very exciting that the World Federation of Neurology is focusing on this uh, very important topic, which is of course central to MDS. Thank you. Let's hope that we would have a fabulous uh, World Brain Day campaign. As you know, we are celebrating not only a day, our campaign usually run uh, all year alone, and we have created uh, a whole lot of material that are available in our toolbox at WFN website, which is freely available for anybody to download and use them, convert them to their own language. As at WFN and MDS, we believe the problems are universal and solutions has to be somewhat universal also. Mm -hmm. We are in this together. So thank you for your comment uh, on them. Mark, uh, the, my next question is, uh, let's go back to your childhood days. Uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about uh, where you were born and uh, where you spent your childhood and uh, how did you come across uh, uh, the wanting to do medicine? What made you to enter into a medical school? those days. <laughs> All right, well, I was uh, born in Philadelphia and uh, spent most of my childhood in that area. Uh, my father was an ophthalmologist, and uh, so I got early exposed to medicine. Uh, but uh, in the beginning, I wasn't so sure I wanted to go into medicine. Even when I went off to college, uh, I was uh, more interested in science, I suppose. Uh, I majored in astronomy, actually, at the beginning of college. Um, but uh, soon uh, I decided after studying that for a year or year and a half that uh, it was a bit too ethereal. It, it didn't relate to people. Uh, as much as medicine did. So I decided to switch into medicine. Now, that switch, um, however, was very clear from the beginning that I was interested in the brain. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, in, in terms of a science background, uh, even beginning in high school, I took a very important uh, course to me in physiological psychology. Uh, and um, that was uh, very exciting, got me interested in the brain. So when I decided to go to medical school, I wanted to, it was clear to me that I wanted to stay in some sort of research and I wanted to be involved with the brain. So that was 
how I went off to medical school with uh, those views uh, clearly in mind already. Was there anything particular that uh, forced you or made you interested in brain at that particular time or it just did happen in that way? Well, uh, it was this uh, course in psychology that I had that got me interested. Uh, I've been interested in many different aspects of science, but uh, it was that uh, course particularly that tilted me toward the brain. But I suppose it was also the case in college that there was a lot of excitement, particularly about the visual system. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, uh, just happened to be at that particular moment. So um, uh, there were a series of courses, or it wasn't a course actually, it was a series of afternoon lectures uh, focused on vision. And uh, I went to those lectures and got very excited uh, about it. Uh, it kept me interested in the brain. I suppose I could have gotten interested in ophthalmology, couldn't I, <laughs> because of my father's interest. But um, it really got me interested in the brain. So what was happening at that time, uh, George Wald, uh, who had gotten the Nobel Prize for Rodobson, and uh, Edmund, Edwin Land, who uh, had an interesting theory of color vision, and Jerry Letvin, who wrote that famous paper, What the Frog's Eye See, it Tells the Frog's Brain, and Hubel and Weasel uh, were working, um, and they eventually, of course, got the Nobel Prize, too, for their work mm -hmm. in vision. So it was an extremely uh, interesting series of talks, and I think that uh, perhaps also uh, convinced me that I was in the right direction. I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head, uh, the talking about you could have gone uh, through to ophthalmology, but you and me both know vision is such an important part of human brain. Basically, 90% or more of our behavior is actually decided by vision. The, even in practical neurology, I always tell my residents that uh, we have to be interested in vision and uh, the eye is the window to the brain. <clears throat> right. Well, there isn't any doubt that uh, the eye and the brain are very much related. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the, you are talking to a converted uh, neurologist from this side of the world. Anyway, so <laughs> the, the, that, that was your formative days. Uh, and uh, then you graduated and you ended up uh, as a neurologist and you were very much interested in science all alone when someone looked at the publication plethora that you put in to the world. The, the, when did you become interested in movement disorders world? And tell us about your connection between the legendary uh, great uh, David Marsden. How did that come okay. about? <laughs> All right, well, let me go back a little bit because there were a couple steps left out there which uh, are valuable to at least briefly mention. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was interested in the brain when I went to medical school, but uh, not necessarily neurology. There's uh, also psychiatry and neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, by the end of medical school, I knew I was interested in neurology. Um, and one of the important uh, people in that regard was Norman Geschwind. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very important influence on me around that time. His uh, work on connections in the brain, uh, what he, uh, that very uh, interesting two-part paper that he wrote on the disconnection syndromes. Absolutely, um, the classics. Uh, he was a very prominent uh, person uh, around Boston, where I, where I was uh, training around that time, and I actually spent a summer with him, um, uh, which uh, kept pushing me in the particular direction of neurology. Um, I also uh, had a very good opportunity in medical school. Uh, Ray Adams was my advisor. Um, so that was a very nice uh, thing, uh, sort of uh, very important neurologist. And uh, as part of my elective time, uh, Dr. Adams suggested that I spend a month with C. Miller Fisher. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And actually, he also recommended that I spend a month with David Kogan, uh, who's a very important neuro, neuro ophthalmologist. Uh, so you kept uh, your the interest in vision <laughs> going. <laughs> but any of that, I, I wound up in neurology uh, nonetheless. How was any it? Of that, uh, uh, Mark, I'll disturb you for a minute. Uh, the, I was trained by one of Miller Fisher's uh, residents who went on to become first geriatric professor in Australia. He talked a lot about Miller Fisher. So you mentioned three huge names in global medicine. Uh, the, 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 tell us about your experience. Uh, how easy to work with them? Were they friendly mentors? Uh, the, the, just uh, spare a few thoughts about them before you move on further. What, all three? Or just, all, all three, uh, all three, all three. All three, all three. <laughs> all right. Uh, Norman, Norman Gesher was a very friendly person. Um, I spent, uh, as I mentioned, one, one summer with him. Uh, and then actually I got to know him very well um, when I was on staff at the Brigham a number of years later. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, he was uh, chief at the Brigham, uh, he was chief at the Beth Israel Hospital when I was at the Brigham. Gazanov is a very, uh, very pleasant person, uh, very bright, very, uh, very thoughtful about things. Uh, it was always fun to talk with him. Mm -hmm. um, Ray Adams was uh, a rather formal person uh, most mm -hmm. of the time, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he was uh, uh, very smart, always knew the right answer and came to it very quickly. Uh, he had a lot of experience and uh, he was an excellent teacher. Now, C. Miller Fisher, I, I really enjoyed. Um, he uh, had uh, different reactions from different people. Um, and uh, well, I should say that I did my residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, with Adams and Fisher. So I got to know them both very well uh, during that period of time, uh, as, as well as early in medical school. So you must have met my... You must have met my mentor, Robert Helm, at that time also then. Uh, he, uh, Robert Helm was there with uh, both gentlemen for about five years. I can't exactly remember the years. Uh, he used to tell a lot of stories to me. Anyway, coming back to you. Right, right, yes. Um, yeah, so um, uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, he was uh, extremely bright as well, of course. Uh, and uh, he would always know the right answer, just as fast as Dr. Adams did. But he uh, didn't tell anybody about it right away. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he slowly worked his way through the cases. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he admitted that what he wanted to do was to learn something from every patient. Mm -hmm. He wanted to learn something new from every case. And Something new from every case. Leave, every case. And he did mm -hmm. not want to leave the patient or the bedside until he learned something new. And uh, there were often uh, rounds that we did with Dr. Fisher where he would stand at the bedside after learning various things about the history and physical exam. And um, then he would stand there trying to figure out what else he should ask or what else he should do to learn something new. And as he stood there thinking, he would often shift his weight from one leg to the other. Mm -hmm. Now, I always thought that was terrific with him thinking. And, uh, you know, while we were there observing the great man thinking, mm -hmm. but a number of people were in a hurry to leave. And uh, yeah, so enough. he, so he had, he had gotten the, uh, nickname of shifting dullness uh, right, right. <laughs> uh, from, from some folks, but I never thought that uh, to be the case myself. Um, in any event, uh, uh, of course, I got to know him very well also. Uh, I had uh, spent some time with him as a medical student, and uh, so I always had a special relationship with him also. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, so I learned a lot from all of them. They mm -hmm. were uh, all, all three were um, uh, very important uh, in my growing up and understanding about things. I think you, th those three were three remarkable human beings. Uh, 
who ever mm. walk across this planet isn't it the amount of contribution that those three done to the humanity we could go on talking for hours the funny enough mm. funny that you mentioned say miller fisher i have never met the great man but i still use uh, what louis kaplan wrote uh, later on i think mm. in 1980s if i remember correctly as uh, miller fisher rules uh, the 17 right, right. <laughs> and uh, i print them out yeah. and i hand them out to my friends <laughs> and tell them that they are still valid yeah 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 no, i i tell you one last uh, story about uh, fisher which uh, indicates both uh, our friendship and uh, his his interest in things um uh, as he uh, got uh, very late in life he he lost most of his vision mm-hmm. uh he was able to see just a little tiny bit and uh, he was interested in the topic of free will and i had gotten interested in it as well mm-hmm. and uh i sent him a copy of uh, one of the papers that i'd written and about 6 months later uh, my secretary um uh called me i was sitting in my office she said you have a call from a dr fisher here would you like to speak with him mm-hmm. and i said yes yeah, sure i didn't know who it was at first but it was it was c miller fisher and he had read every word of the paper right must have taken him hours and hours to to read it and then he wanted to talk about it right 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 uh, and it was it was great fun we talked for about an hour <clears throat> he he died within a year of that mm-hmm. um uh, he was uh, so I, that was the last time that i that i spoke with him but but he maintained an intellectual interest in uh, really lots of things i heard he was attending rounding and grand rounds uh, up until late stage of his life uh, is that correct I am I am sure that uh, he was doing that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Absolutely. Um Adams as well to a certain extent, although uh, toward the end of Adams' life, uh he developed very severe back pain due to spinal stenosis mm-hmm. and had a very hard time standing. Mm-hmm. Um and he did go to some grand rounds, but um he had to be in a wheelchair. uh so um he he was not he, he sort of backed out i think of clinical stuff as he got older the, in fact the classic textbook uh, that alan ropa is editing now the victor adams uh, neurology had always been mm-hmm. my favorite book uh, i got a small anecdote uh, my son who is studying medicine at monash now as a first year he was just born when i was entering into neurology training so i was having my the at that time edition of Victor and Adams he figured out when he was about one and a half uh, that dad seems to love something more than him so he he crawled down to my study room and he took a pen and he he basically punctured a couple of pages and scribbled all over which i still keep it as a memorabilia because he didn't <laughs> like uh, his dad to love something else other than him he doesn't believe this story as true by the way now mark uh, coming back to you so th- those were your the, the valuable days with uh, very important men the i'm assuming that adams and uh, the similar fisher would have been great friends as well at the same time in their work oh they life. oh they were very good friends yes yeah they they um they uh both came from boston city hospital where they were working with derek denny brown hmm. another great name another great man uh he was just uh finishing up when i started medical school so i i heard a couple of lectures and rounds from him um but uh yeah they both were there uh at boston city with him and then adams got the professorship at mass general and he left for the mass general and took miller fisher with him i'm assuming that these men there was no sort of a work life balance as such they just kept working and uh, being passionate on the work that they were doing that's what they would have been doing for the most part would, would it be fair to assume yeah that's that's probably right so they uh, they didn't have a lot of work life balance they worked very hard um although they had different timing <clears throat> which was interesting uh, adams would uh, tell the incoming residents 
that uh, one or the other of them would likely be there in the hospital any time. So that uh, Adams would come in very early in the morning and uh, leave perhaps at a reasonable time in the afternoon. Uh, Fisher would come in a little later, but he would stay until very late at night. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually, I, I recall once um, uh, when I was down in the emergency room, I saw an interesting patient with uh, actually interesting eye movements. Uh, uh, we were all having difficulty trying to figure out what they were. Mm -hmm. It was something like one o'clock in the morning or maybe two o'clock in the morning. And um, I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe Dr. Fisher's there. We could give him a call and see if he would be interested. So I uh, rang his number and uh, picked up the phone and uh, it was, uh, hello? I said, oh, Dr. Fisher, it's uh, Mark Hallett. I'm down in the emergency room. I have this interesting patient. Oh, be right there. <laughs> and, <laughs> <in> the <morning. laughs> so he came right down, uh, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning. Uh, he was still there uh, and happy to, uh, happy to help out. I guess the uh, the I hope this is not an inflammatory comment uh, against the youngsters who might be watching this. Uh, I guess the reason that uh, these gentlemen uh, didn't burn out or suffered from burnout is they were so passionate uh, uh, at their work uh, and they were enjoying their work, uh, isn't it? Yes, right. Uh, you you are absolutely right. Uh, they they certainly did. Um, did enjoy every minute of what they were doing. Um, and times were different then. Uh, of course, I think these days uh, people spend a lot of time on administrative stuff and paperwork and all sorts of things that uh, they didn't do in those days. Mm -hmm. They could uh, spend, when they were working, they could spend a lot more time focused on things that one might consider more interesting. Mm -hmm. The, 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 we shouldn't forget that uh, the, while they were publishing machines, uh, we didn't have internet, uh, we didn't have uh, EndNote, uh, we didn't have uh, Mendeley. I always admire these uh, old teachers who kept uh, mm. producing some of the greatest uh, of uh, material despite uh, those mm. difficulties. I assume they had some good secretariat support though. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. That was so, very important. Yes. Uh, so the, the, the moving alone, anything else uh, that uh, we didn't touch <laughs> upon before we get to Master and Days? Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. There's one. There's one brief other step that got me to uh, Marsden, and um, that was um, a a two year interval between internship and residency that I spent at the National Institutes of Health, and. Um, that was during the Vietnam War, and uh, everybody who was a physician had to do something uh, in, de in relation to the war, and I went to NIH, so that was a pretty good thing to be doing. I actually did membrane biophysics at that time, which was another interest of mine. But while I was there, um, there were uh, a number of seminars that were going on in motor control. Uh, Ed Everts uh, had a very important laboratory in uh, uh, motor control. He was uh, one of the first uh, scientists to record from awake monkeys uh, while they were doing motor tasks. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, got a whole group of uh, very excited people around him to be studying as well. And that, uh, I won't go through the whole litany there, but that included Malin DeLong. Mm -hmm. Malin, uh, uh, so each uh, person that went was assigned a part of the brain. Um, uh, Everett's part was the cortex, and uh, Malin got the basal ganglia. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was his assignment. Um, so, um, uh, in, in any event, Malin was there at the time, and we had a, uh, a lot of seminars in Everett's laboratory. Uh, and we also had an evening journal club 
I got to know Balin very well at that time. And it was all that stuff that got me interested in motor control. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what tilted me in that particular direction. And uh, then uh, I went to residency subsequently and we had some time to do research at that point. And so I started doing some motor control research. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the opportunity to do that when I was in NIH because I was doing membrane biophysics. Mm -hmm. But uh, I developed the interest in motor control and um, therefore um, did that uh, while I was a uh, resident. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, that then became a logical thing to do after residency to continue working in the motor control area. And uh, I was particularly excited by the papers that uh, David Marsden was doing along with uh, uh, Merton and Morton mm -hmm. on long latency stretch reflexes. Mm -hmm. There were some very interesting papers. And um, I had been studying uh, voluntary quick movements mm -hmm. as a part of my residency project. And so I proposed a project to interact the long latency reflexes uh, with the voluntary movements. And uh, that was the project uh, that uh, I sold David Marsden on and uh, then went to the lab to do that particular project. Um, did you visit it had him nothing in the UK? Or? I'm sorry? Did you visit him in the UK at that time or were you exchanging information through snail mail? Because there was no email at that time. Yes, it was, it was, it was mostly snail mail, but uh, I actually did visit him in the UK uh, about, I guess it was about eight or nine months in advance because I wanted to uh, make a final decision about what to do. Uh, very few people knew who David Marsden was at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I was interested in him because of the papers. He was, but he was actually only, uh, he was only, actually only a few years older than I was. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he was uh, pretty young when he got his professorship. Well, he was very young when he got his professorship. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so not too many people knew who he was. And uh, when I was asking around, uh, I couldn't get very much advice about whether it was a good thing to do or not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I did want to visit him and, um, and, I, and I did so. And how was the first encounter? Did he come to the airport to meet up with you or did you have to take a camp and then go and visit him? At <laughs> no, he, he didn't meet me at the airport when I arrived. Uh, right, no. right. Uh, uh, actually, it's a, uh, you know, when I, when I got there, uh, I finally got to the lab, uh, he he did uh, give me a nice orientation to the lab. He showed me where the lab was, uh, you know, described everything to me in terms of what was going on. Uh, we already knew what my project was uh, when I got there. Uh, but uh, it was uh, a woman by the name of Jane Adam, who was a PhD student in the lab that uh, really introduced me to all the equipment and everything else that was going on. Um, so, uh, I actually didn't see very much of him the first six months of my one year fellowship. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very busy mm -hmm. doing things. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, uh, after about the five months or so, I, uh, said, you know, I really should talk to David Mars <laughs> right, right. to show him what I was doing. Yes. And uh, you went there because of him. <laughs> Uh, so I, so I set up an appointment. It turned out to be for a Saturday morning, which was the only time that he was uh, free. free. Uh, and I uh, showed him what I was doing and he got, uh, very interested. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for the second half of my, uh, uh, fellowship, I saw him all the time, right, right, <laughs> regularly. Right. right. And, um, he even invited me to join him. Uh, with uh, Merton and Morton when they were doing their experiments mm 
mm -hmm. which they did in a small lab at uh, Queen Square mm -hmm. on the weekends. That was the only time that uh, they all could do it. Um, Bert, Bert Morton uh, was, was an engineer at Queen Square, um, and uh, uh, Merton came down from Cambridge, and uh, David, uh, well, of course, at that point, he was at the Institute of Psychiatry and King's mm -hmm. uh, south of London. So uh, they all got together to do their relatively famous experiments, and I was invited to join them a few times as well. Was uh, Philip Thompson and Tony Lan and others uh, growing up at around that time, or did they come later on? No, oh, much, much later. They're all, they're all youngsters. Right, right. <laughs> they were, they're probably in the American schools those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, uh, yeah, actually, um, Tony uh, Lang came, I think, a, a couple years after I left. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually rang me up before he went, because still David wasn't really that well known, and right, uh, he right. wanted to know whether it was worthwhile <laughs> going visiting. and spending time with David Marsden. Uh, right, right. And I told him, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Philip, I didn't meet for some years later. Right, right. Um, the, yeah. the reason that I mentioned those two names is I got to know you first uh, when you visited Adelaide uh, when I was doing my year with uh, Philip Thompson a uh, long time mm -hmm. ago. And I remembered mm -hmm. you as a very friendly person answering our dumb questions uh, at, 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 <laughs> at that time with very friendly approach. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 was the movement disorder society or the concept of movement disorder society existed at that time or not at that time? Oh no! Much much later. Um, it was about uh, it was about a decade later, actually, um, that everything uh, everything started. Uh, I was I was there uh, the year academic year nineteen seventy five to seventy six. Mm -hmm. That's when I did my uh, my my fellowship there, <clears throat> and um, the. Um, the origin of the Movement Disorder Society and the International Medical Society of Motor Disturbances, uh, I don't have my dates directly in front of me, but I think started, I think, in 1986. So it was about a, it was about a decade later. And um, the, uh, the first meeting that was joint between those two societies was in 1990. Uh, and that was called the first international movement disorder meeting. Right. Um, I was the president of ISMD at that time. Stan Fon was the president of uh, the Movement Disorder Society. Mm -hmm. And um, the ISMD had, was organizing meetings and the Movement Disorder Society never had organized a meeting. It was only it had only organized a journal. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the first joint meeting of the two societies uh, we called the first Congress, mm -hmm. although ISMD had had prior meetings that it had organized. And then the uh, there was a merger of the two societies. Uh, and the merged society kept the name Movement Disorder Society, mm -hmm. but it was uh, really a different society because it was a merged society. It was, it was not that the ISMD merged into MDS. MDS and ISMD merged as a uh, partnership of equals, mm -hmm. uh, but they kept the name of one of the old societies. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they didn't keep the initials of the old societies. So the, the Movement Disorder Society, when it was a separate society from ISMD, was abbreviated MODIS, M-O-D-I-S. Mm -hmm. And uh, the MDS came about because ISMD didn't want to have uh, it appear as if it was merging into the old society. 
Mm -hmm. Even though the name was the same, the abbreviation differed. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the indication of the difference. The other thing, of course, is that MDS or MODIS did not have a logo. ISMD had a logo. So the logo of the Movement Disorder Society is the logo of what was the ISMD. Right. Ironically, a couple of years back, as you uh, well aware, yeah, they added international Parkinson's bit to the MDS, uh, and now they, they, they are known as IPMDS. Uh, every time when right. I was writing something on World Brain Day, uh, the, I have to sort of deal with uh, some of my co-authors. Uh, uh, they, should we call it IPMDS? Uh, because now it is known as MDS, right? You're wrong with globally. It has become <laughs> a sort of household name. So in the end, most documents, right. we, we agree to you. So, all right, let's call it IPMDS, but within brackets, maybe we could call it MDS. <laughs> and uh, you probably would have figured out for this video, I, I've been using the term MDS for the most part. So any... Any memorable things uh, that you would like to share with our viewers uh, from your first visit to London uh, out of that uh, one year? Well, the first visit to London? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, the, well, there are many memorable things, but uh, I suppose the thing that caught me by surprise was the uh, uh, thought that the language was the same between British and American, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of words uh, and uh, phrases that are used in the, in the two forms of English which uh, are different and uh, that uh, and occasionally would uh, get people into uh, trouble, trouble. <laughs> of you know, various kinds. Uh, I don't know, do you have time to hear one of my favorite stories in that regard? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yes, why not? You want me to go for it? All right, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. So this um, deals with the uh, fact that it was also an important part of my fellowship uh, that I began working in the area of myoclonus. Uh, David had, David Marsden had gotten interested in myoclonus and um, he co-opted Ted Reddell's registrar, uh, David Chadwick, mm -hmm. and uh, David Chadwick identified uh, the patients with myoclonus, and he brought them into the laboratory for physiological studies. Mm -hmm. Now, Jane Adam had been assigned to study the myoclonus, but she wasn't interested, uh, right. so she said, she, she asked me to do it. Right. And so that's how I got involved with the myoclonus. Right. Right. In any event, one day, <laughs> One day, uh, David and I were studying a patient in the laboratory, and it'd be, uh, it was going uh, long, and it was lunchtime. So I uh, ran off to the cafeteria at the Institute of Psychiatry to get some sandwiches. Right. So I, so I went, through the, uh, went in the line, and I wanted to get a sandwich for David and a sandwich for myself. Right. And um, so I asked the... Uh, lady uh, behind the desk, uh, could I have two sandwiches, please? Right. And she gave me what I thought was one sandwich. Right. So I, uh, so I uh, looked at it and said, but there's one sandwich here. Could I have two? And she looked right. at it and said, there are two sandwiches there. And we went back and forth a little bit until I realized that uh, the British word for sandwich is equivalent to half a sandwich in the United States. Right, right. Uh, and if I wanted two sandwiches, I should have ordered two rounds. Two rounds, right, right. Then I would have gotten two sandwiches. But uh, right. when I ordered two, two sandwiches, I got one round <laughs> instead. <laughs> you, you kept uh, fasting on that day, did you? <laughs> <laughs> So anyhow, that's, uh, that's sort of one example of the uh, difference in language. <laughs> I, I know the feeling. The, as you know, the Australian English is, uh, there are terms and uh, the phrases that uh, we use here, very different to UK and USA both, that can run into <laughs> trouble at times. Uh, let's not uh, go there at this point in time. <laughs> so the, the, 
you had an illustrious uh, career mark looking back uh, what do you think uh, is the greatest uh, achievement or greatest contribution that you have done to the mankind uh, throughout your career what are you most uh, proud of uh, <laughs> out of the work that you have done <laughs> ah that's you a can, very you can pick question. couple if you want you can pick couple <laughs> uh, i i i suppose you know one of the things that um, that i uh, uh, I've done in my career is uh, it's sort of a two-part activity and uh, it's a sort of the two-part official uh, charge of the NIH as well and that is to do research and to do training mm -hmm. and uh, I must say that uh, I'm uh, I think in terms of uh, any legacy or what I've done uh, Perhaps it's the training more than anything else, uh, because there's a, there's a whole group of uh, uh, people uh, now all over the world who have uh, spent time uh, with me at NIH or in Boston. I, I, I was at uh, Harvard for eight years before I uh, went down to NIH. And uh, it's, it's that training, I think, to a large extent, if, you know, in terms of a legacy, uh, that, that lasts for a long time. Um, in the, we were, we've spent a lot of time on this, uh, on this discussion, talking about people like uh, Geshwin and Adams and Fisher and Marsden, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, their influences on me uh, and uh, then I've had influences, I think, on a lot of other people. And that is the sort of very important diffusion of um, uh, knowledge and ways of thinking that I think, uh, well, at least I, I, I hope will be considered uh, valuable over the course of time. I, th I think you picked up the, the, the you picked up a very important point. Uh, I mean, as I, as I pointed out, uh, I myself have never met or seen, say, Miller Fisher uh, or Ray Adams for that matter. But uh, you have already uh, gave me a few more new ideas that I could try out with my residents and students in time to come. And I already told you that uh, my mentor, one of my key mentors. Uh, who was a resident of Ray Adams and Samuel Fisher for five years, who kept on brainwashing me on various things that he picked up from those two gentlemen. And the diffusion is uh, almost uh, unparalleled. And I already told you that I'm using Louis Kaplan's printout uh, on a regular interval to remind uh, residents uh, in 2020 even that uh, the issues that you see in bedside, uh, you should settle them at mm -hmm. that time. The great man Samuel Fisher said that uh, and I agree with that point in 2020. And he also said that uh, at any given time, you should have a couple of projects in your hand. Uh, and uh, I always <laughs> remind uh, the, my junior colleagues that you should have a couple of projects at hand. So the diffusion is uh, almost uh, generational, isn't it? Yeah. And if I had to put, I guess, in terms of the science, if I had to <clears throat> put it in one sort of uh, uh, area it would be the sort of translation of basic motor control principles into the understanding of movement disorders. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been interested in the basic science side of movement as well as in movement disorders and uh, the application of those principles into the understanding of movement disorders have helped understand the pathophysiology of these different uh, uh, different entities. So, uh, and I've uh, spent a lot of time with many different disorders uh, from Parkinson's to dystonia <clears throat> to tremor. And these days, uh, with my interest in functional neurological disorders, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I think all this brings uh, very important uh, information about the way the brain works. Uh, to the application that is relevant to our patients. And uh, of course, the more we understand about them, the uh, hopefully the better we'll be able to treat their different problems. The functional movement disorders are a fascinating entity also 
the disadvantage for those of us uh, who has to see functional movement disorders is uh, you might disagree with me on this uh, because uh, you have more toolkits uh, than what I have in your the laboratory. Compared to epilepsy folks, uh, we don't have a sort of a video EEG to tell us uh, that uh, this is uh, a this is a functional disorder. This is not a, a not a non-functional disorder. And uh, the to make it make the discussion more interesting. Uh, I remember watching uh, one of uh, the Dr. John Morris presentation at an MDS meeting years back where he pointed out a whole series of animals, uh, functional movement disorders with beautiful video clips of uh, birds who are faking uh, different, uh, we know that functional movement disorders are not faking, but the, the, I, just got the, got the, I just thought that uh, gee, this, is, this seems to be an animal behavior. It, it's not only limited to humans. Uh, so what, the, my question is, uh, what got you to be interested in functional movement disorders and what are the latest insights uh, of functional movement disorders that you like to share with the audience uh, in, in very simple terms? Right, well, what got me interested uh, was two things, really. Um, one was uh, that, uh, I saw that there were a large number of these patients uh, that were uh, that were there just coming into my clinic. I learned that that was the case for other clinics as well, and that no one was paying any attention to the patients. That uh, they had a great deal of disability, uh, and uh, there wasn't any research going on. There wasn't a good way to make a diagnosis. There weren't any good treatments. There's uh, a virtually no funding of any uh, research that NIH had. And I said to myself, look, this is a big gap that uh, someone needs to be interested in. And so I thought, well, gee, maybe I should get interested. Um, I actually wrote a a brief piece, uh, must have been at least a decade ago, probably more, uh, called uh, Psychogenic Movement Disorders, A Crisis for Neurology. Mm -hmm. uh, I really thought it was, uh, you know, people had to get interested in this and mm -hmm. try to figure it out. The other reason was a, uh, a basic science reason. And that is that uh, here there are patients who say have a tremor that looks like it's a voluntary movement or have myoclonus. It looks like it's a voluntary movement. However, the patient feels it's involuntary. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out, they're not faking. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, very interesting one is how is it possible for the brain to produce what looks like a voluntary movement but is not felt to be voluntary and uh, that then gets you into an extremely important question is uh, what then is a voluntary movement uh, why uh, do we believe that some movements are voluntary and some aren't? What is the physiology of voluntariness? And of course, that's a very important uh, basic question. And I got very interested in that as well as uh, what sort of process in the brain uh, is that all about? So, I've then been following a parallel path as I've done with all the other different types of uh, movement disorders. Uh, what are the uh, basic science elements of motor control? What are the pathophysiological elements of the patients? Can we go back and forth between the two and understand them better? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, we now have some reasonable insights 
into at least an aspect of voluntariness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, there's a lot more to learn in, in this regard, but uh, it, it does appear that at least one aspect of voluntariness is that it is a thought that you have about it. You believe that it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. Whatever else you can say about voluntariness, it's something that you feel, that you believe, you think about. Mm -hmm. And we know where that arises. That, that appears to arise from an interesting brain network uh, that involves a central node in the right temporoparietal junction. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that uh, that particular part of the brain malfunctions in the patients with functional movement disorders. Mm -hmm. So we have a very interesting co-joining of our understanding of the nature of voluntariness and a problematic dysfunction of that network in the patients who don't have a proper sense of voluntariness even though the movement appears to be produced by the same mechanisms that produce what we consider to be voluntary movements. Now, there's a lot more to this story. Uh, we've been working on it a long time, and I must say I'm pleased to be able to say that there's a lot more folks working in this area now as well. Um, as you may know, we've started a new society, the Functional Neurological Disorders Society, Mm -hmm. um, we have neurologists, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, physical therapists, um, all the people that are interested in these entities, all trying to work together to understand the situation better. And I think that uh, the field is now beginning to move along. Um, I'm certainly not the only one that pushed it, but I was one of the people that began to push yeah, it. Yes. And, um, but I, but I think it, it does demonstrate this uh, very important uh, uh, parallelism between the basic motor control physiology and movement disorder pathophysiology, where uh, each one helps the other and they move along together. In fact, your classic uh, book on functional movement disorders uh, from AAN publications uh, is proudly sitting behind me on my small book rack, <laughs> which is covered with the uh, uh, COVID-19 virus behind me on my virtual <laughs> Mark, right. Right. The, Mark, my next question is, uh, as you know, the global neurology is uh, making significant headway with uh, uh, the World Federation of Neurology, all the national and international societies, uh, Global Neurological Alliance, uh, you have seen the great deal of advocacy that is happening. We both know that uh, the neurological disorders are the leading cause of disability. We both know that the neurological disorders are the second cause of death. Uh, we both know that brain matters, of course, uh, in all kinds of disorders. The criticism and questions uh, still exist uh, every time when I travel around the world virtually to interview various people from various countries saying that uh, when it gets to publishing material, it is hard to publish uh, from non-English speaking countries. Uh, uh, there is disparities uh, in editorial boards uh, when it comes to journals. Uh, there is discrimination uh, for ethnicity, discrimination uh, against uh, different uh, gender-related issues. Uh, so the, I'm not discarding all those things. Uh, the, 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 what, what I'm asking from you is, uh, let's concentrate on the positive things. Uh, even in the middle of a pandemic, we have seen the recently concluded European Academy of Neurology meeting, which is a new organization, of course, compared to the powerful American Academy of Neurology or even World Federation of Neurology. I read somewhere that uh, the number of virtual attendees were over 40,000 people. And despite in the pandemic, the take up for World Brain Day activities seems to be massive, as, as far as uh, I can say, as the chair of the World Brain Day Committee. So on a, on a positive sense, despite some of these uh, criticisms, uh, I think uh, we have this unprecedented opportunity 
where the scientific community is together uh, through internet and all the technology. Uh, my question to you is, uh, as a senior leader in the field, uh, as someone who had seen a uh, lot more great uh, people and a lot more great development uh, from pre-internet era to now, how can we get this job done? How can we make sure that uh, we minimize these disparities as much as we can and promote brain health uh, in one world, uh, putting all collaborations together What's the advice that you can give to all of us uh, and youngsters, uh, wherever they are, whether they speak English as the first language or English as their third or fourth language, or not speak English at all? Right. Well, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, issues there in terms of trying to uh, improve things all around the world. I, I think that's where there is an important role for the World Federation of Neurology, for the Global Brain Alliance. Uh, I, I get a sense from going to the Global World Alliance meetings, and I've, I've been to a number of them now over the past years, uh, this, is, this is where all the international uh, neurological subspecialty groups get together uh, under the auspices of the WFM. Uh, I, I get the sense there that many organizations are beginning now to be uh, turning outward to the developing world mm -hmm. uh, to try to find ways to be spreading the information uh, around better to uh, uh, in order to try to help out these, these, these problems that you're just talking about. Um, for example, um, I've been very involved in the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology, mm -hmm. and um, we've had, uh, uh, in that organization, there have been fellowships for people uh, from, uh, with an emphasis on developing countries, so that people would uh, learn uh, more uh, things in the developing countries. One of the things that I learned at, a, at the WFN meetings is that many of the people who were coming, for example, out of Africa, uh, when they got their training, never went back to Africa. Right, right. And uh, so the, some of the leaders told us, well, what you need to do is to develop uh, education within Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the IFCN now has been trying to try to do that. The Movement Disorder Society has been trying to do that. The WFN has been trying to do that. Uh, set up uh, training centers within Africa, uh, which gets the education closer to uh, where the people are, uh, and gets the fellowships closer to uh, where the people are, and uh, keeps them there increasing the sort of nucleus of uh, improving medical care and uh, that is going on in these different places. So I think that I, I am getting the sense that there's a lot of interest in trying to do that now, mm -hmm. um, trying to uh, improve education worldwide. I think so. I think we should, as I said, we should look at the positive aspects uh, and uh, the get this job done. And my personal belief is uh, this is definitely the time. We have all the technology. We have the knowledge from past and the knowledge from present. Uh, whether we are in the middle of a pandemic or not, uh, I mean, we are talking to each other from different corners of the world, uh, talking on a common theme, just to make it a point uh, that it can be done. Uh, right, right. You are about as far away in the world as you could possibly be from what I am now. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. So let's hope that uh, the, the, the mission of uh, the Global Neurology Alliance would uh, continue and uh, we would continue to build a just society with uh, the best possible brain health for all as best as we can. To, to finish off this discussion, uh, the outside medicine and movement disorders. Uh, tell us about your other personal life. Uh, uh, 
uh, how do you spare any how how do you how, how do you how do you find joy out of medicine uh, the, the your family life uh, your hobbies uh, yeah so uh, right so i so i think it's uh, uh, mostly the family uh, okay. that uh, is very important in that regard and uh, uh, I, and I must say, uh, I, I have I have two children and now one one grandchild, uh, and uh, I've often said that um, uh, I have enjoyed children at every age. Right. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, uh, liked them uh, liked the kids when they were babies and uh, liked them when they are uh, older. Uh, my uh, my children are now uh, uh, forty five and thirty nine, and, and I still like them. <laughs> I still yeah. like spending time with them. <laughs> we still travel with them and uh, spend time with them. And uh, I suppose that's uh, that is a very that's clearly a very important part of my life. Absolutely. Your grandchild, how old is she or he? She's she's five years old. Oh, right. I heard from my mentors that uh, they have been enjoying grandchildren much more so than their children, and they have never given me a specific uh, explanation behind that. They asked me to you watch and wait. I think I have. I've well, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I personally like them the same, but I think that uh, the reason that people say that is that. Uh, you can enjoy your grandchildren, but don't have to worry about taking care of them all day long. <laughs> because your children take them back in the evening or afternoon or the weekend. But uh, I must say, I, I've enjoyed the, the, the children and the grandchildren equally. <laughs> with, with regard to your reading, Mark, outside uh, medicine and movement disorders, uh, do you read a lot? Uh, uh, if so, what's your favorite book? Yeah, so uh, that's one thing that uh, fell aside for many years. I, I must say that I was reading so much and writing so much and working and working with the family and that I didn't do a lot of reading for a long time. But now I insist on doing it and I've been doing that for the last um, probably decade or so now. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I insist on taking time off and, uh, and, and doing some reading. What's my favorite book? My, my favorite book is always the last book I've read. Right, right. <laughs> what did you read last? I, 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 I always hate it when the book is over. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, I get into the characters and the, and the situation and uh, I, I just don't want it to end. <laughs> but, but they do and then I pick up another one and get involved with the next one. But, uh, so my favorite book is always, always the last one I've read. <laughs> right, right. Professor Mark Hallett, uh, I took a lot of time away from you. Thank you very much for your time and uh, the shedding insight uh, of your journey so far. We wish you all the very best, uh, good health, uh, and stay safe and stay well. And we look forward to seeing you physically at uh, a future WFN <laughs> or MDS meeting, hopefully once this virus is under some sort of a control. Yes, yes, we all hope that. Hope to see you uh, soon, and uh, I've enjoyed our conversation quite a lot. Thank Bye. you very much. Nice Mark. to chat with you. Likewise. Take care. Bye. Bye.